Bueno, el nombre que recibí es Wendelin. Usamos pronombre nosotros y ella, we and she. And uh, somos madre, we're a mother. We are a land steward. Um, we are a lover, a learner, um, a student, a humble, humble student. Um, and our entry point into language justice work is um, that moment of like realizing the weight of the fact that our mommy's name is Josefina and not Josephine, you know, of trying to, to teach her how to say George Washington Bridge instead of George Washington Bridge. United States of America instead of United States of America, you know, so that she can pass her citizenship test, right? So this is where we begin to sort of understand the importance of language and of these different forms of communication and how they create access to power, you know, and to resources. Um, there was a moment of us trying to understand what are the ways that we can contribute to what we understand as what needs to happen. You know, people call it movement, you know, this impulse, you know, to live fuller lives that create this access for a deeper love, you know? And so in trying to understand like what our role is in that, we came to the land, we, we came to the land. The land remembered us. And in that work, we were asked to, to use this capacity, to use this don que tenemos, ¿verdad? De poder hablar estos dos idiomas, ¿verdad? A hacer alcance a agricultores en la comunidad uh, hispanohablante. Y ahí nos surgió una invitación a hacer un entrenamiento de justicia del lenguaje. Y en un instante nos enamoramos. Nos enamoramos con la práctica nos enamoramos con el amor que recibimos de los facilitadores, una de las cuales fue Telesh, ¿verdad? De, de la manera en que, que entendemos que el lenguaje es algo más expansivo de lo que sale de la boca en palabras y que se intertwines and sort of like reaches into and through and within and throughout every aspect of our lives. And so, in that way, that understanding of our capacity to support, right? To use the skills that we have to create these spaces for connection, right? It's been a blessing since then. Uh, mi nombre es Catalina Nieto, pronombre es ella. Eh, soy colombiana, crecí, nací, crecí en Colombia, en Bogotá, eh, en las montañas de los Andes. Eh, soy migrante, uh, migré hace 21 años a los Estados Unidos con mi familia. Soy mestiza, soy bailarina, soy artista um, y también uh, una language justice nerd, language justice practitioner. Um, yeah, um, and my entry point to language justice, I would say, was was the experience of migrating and living as a as an immigrant in the U.S. Um, from the beginning, just having to navigate living in a world in these two languages that I have, um, and. Um, I did, uh, I was an organizer with an immigrant rights organization in the South in Tennessee. And um, in my organizing work, I started doing like bilingual organizing or actually more, just like there were multiple languages in, in the immigrant communities there. So I was figuring it out without really a framework of language justice. It was through, um, doing my organizing work in the South um, with immigrant communities there that I met um, Monica Hernandez, who was working as a multicultural organizer at Highlander Center for Research and Education. And um, 
I went to do an internship there for three months. Um, and there I met Roberto Tijerina. And um, Roberto was uh, bringing forward this whole curriculum of uh, language justice and interpreting for social justice. Um, and he was following the footsteps of others like um, Alice Johnson, um, Ada Volkmer, Pancho Arguelles, Andrea Arias. Um, but yeah, it was really through the work at Highlander Center that I came across um, this concept of language justice. At the time, I didn't really pay too much attention. Um, but it was a few years later that Roberto and another friend, Josh, were doing a training in DC, a language justice training. And I went for a two hour workshop. And I just also, it took two hours to just understand the concept of um, how building multilingual movements and getting movements to like talking to each other, building with each other. And that was one of the pillars of movement. Um, and yeah, I just also kind of fell in love with it immediately. And the week later, they were doing an interpreting for social justice training at Wait Wayside Center for Popular Education. So I went as a participant. And after that, I just started interpreting, um, mostly for movement. Um, and more and more, the more I did this, the more I fell in love with it. And um, now uh, mostly committed to training more folks to do this work from our communities, from immigrant communities, from black communities, queer communities. Um, and um, yeah, just working with organizations to build some depth in, in this work as they do their movement work. I'm thinking of, um, a conversation that we had around the table at the Finca Josco Bravo with Wendy from Via Campesina. She was challenging us, or maybe not challenging, just like having a conversation about how we were interpreting um, the term transnational solidarity. And she told us that it's a term that it's actually was uh, coined um, through the free trade agreements. And um, she was also telling us that what they would use is more something like solidaridad entre pueblos, which there's not a good translation in, in English, but solidarity among peoples, you know, of, of different lands. That's more or less what it means. And these... Um, this understanding of even, even in Spanish, how are we using terms of the oppressor in our movements? And uh, how could we shift and be more conscious of even the language we use that comes from movement, that comes from the land? You know, so I said yes to these for, that, for those type of moments. I'm thinking of how we, in our language justice plan, we created a whole plan to make sure that there were two interpreters in every bus when we were going to a site visit. And we had interpretation equipment given to everyone in that bus. I'm thinking of the conversation that happened on the way to one of the site visits, where someone, a movement maker from Cambodia, is talking about the use of Agent Orange in the war there. And then, someone from Puerto Rico saying how the U.S. tested Agent Orange, Orange here. And then the folks from Copina are there also in exchange in this conversation. And those threads, those elitos that are woven of understanding um, the systematic ways in which, in which peoples are being oppressed, the connections all the connections and these are folks that don't speak the same language and are in movement and in luchas and then not only sharing about how oppression looks but then sharing about what they're doing about it their strategies their luchas then later on we're at the farm around the compost pile and they're sharing about how they're doing compost and next thing you know the conversation turns into 
a conversation about are you reclaiming your ancestral lands or just getting a lease from the government? And the folks from the Garifuna community from Oflane is sharing about their lucha to reclaim their ancestral lands and sharing that with folks from Puerto Rico. This is what language justice does. We, we did a very intentional plan that took a lot, of, a lot of labor, a lot of love, so that those connections could happen. When we learned that we were going to Finca Josco Bravo, there was this moment, you know, of connecting to the work that we're currently doing with land workers in uh, Muncie, Lenape territories, and Scatacoke lands, on uh, Mohican lands, um, and what is known as like Northern New Jersey, upstate New York. So I think that moment of learning about our visit to Finca Josco Bravo was a, a moment that brought us very viscerally to the work that we do with farm workers in the Northeast region of the United States. Um, and understanding the connection to the lands that we have here and being able to witness and to facilitate and to continue to cultivate, right, those cross-language connections with folks that are doing similar work here was a moment of like this almost like childhood like giddiness excitement and joy you know um to be able to literally like be barefoot with one hand on the ground um and to be able to channel these exchanges that Catalina is describing right about um black U.S. folks talking about their relationship to land, talking about what it means to sort of like understand how one of our teachers, Leah Penniman, says the land was the site of the oppression. It was not the oppressor, right? So what it means to begin to heal that relationship and then to do so within a context where land access is a, is a true barrier, right? And so to have the connection between that experience, between the Garifuna experience and between the Boricua experience and to be able to channel that, to be able to support that exchange was just a very, very powerful and affirming experience, right? We have memories of this holding of the team that we have, right? This building, right? This gathering of our people, right? To hold this work and how we came together and the different moments that folks experience in terms of their own connection to their language, in terms of their own connection to their blackness, in terms of their own connection to their healing, right? By way of this work, right? By way of, of the spaciousness que esta apertura crea, ¿verdad? Cuando podemos facilitar estas, estos tipos de conexiones y que es el poder situarnos en ese mismo medio y presenciar, 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 presenciar esos, esas conexiones, ¿verdad? Y saber que, que yo soy tú y tú eres yo, ¿verdad? Y vernos en eso y poder literalmente canalizar que entra y que salga, ¿verdad? En ese acto de interpretar, ¿verdad? También a, a, nos acordamos de esos momentitos como muy íntimos, ¿verdad? muy íntimos, donde hablamos sobre nuestras visiones, donde hablamos sobre, sobre el impacto de este trabajo, de los movement makers, ¿verdad? Como, como Imara compartió, eh, como, como ese trabajo ha, ha cambiado la forma que ella, que ella hace su trabajo, ¿verdad? Escuchar a Nicole como movement maker, declararse como intérprete y describir y a, enseñarnos lo que es una malincha, ¿verdad? Y, y entender el linaje que tiene este trabajo, ¿verdad? Y, y, y también presenciar en mí misma eh, eh, las oportunidades y el camino que ese trabajo me ha, me ha proveído hacia el amor, a, a poder quererme a mí, a otros, a, 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 a la tierra, a profundizar esa relación, ¿verdad? Por eso yo dije que sí. Y siempre lo diré. Me recordé de otro momento. <risa> Porque esta vez trabajamos 
con el Garífuna también. Y vinieron dos personas, Ingrid y Aimé, de comunidades Garífunas, a, a ser parte del equipo de interpretación. Y cuando estábamos en la ceremonia, Taina, Ingrid habló en Garífuna. Y más adelantito, una de las personas, una de las sanadoras que estaba ahí en esa ceremonia de las sanadoras afrodescendientes negras, le dijo, cuando yo escuché, cuando te escuché hablar, escuché a mis ancestres en mi oído. Les escuché. Pensar en esa, en esa conexión y el, el elevar la, los idiomas ancestrales de antes de la colonización. El haber podido tener un espacio para, para enraizar en eso y al mismo tiempo tener espacios también para hablar del descolonizar de, de nuestros idiomas inglés y español, de hacer los idiomas más expansivos, eh, queer, eh, de comunidades negras. Eh. Esa, sí, esa es otra de las razones por las que dijimos que, y yo dije que sí a este trabajo. Nuestros movimientos son multilingües. ¿Verdad? Y que hay algo en, en esa reconexión, en esa reivindicación de la memoria, ¿verdad? De lo que es el, el, el acordarnos de nuestras lenguas maternas, ¿verdad? El, el acercarnos a esas formas de comunicarnos que está, um, ¿cómo se dice? Like, anclada y enraizada en las enseñanzas de la misma tierra, de los territorios, ¿verdad? De nuestro cuerpo territorio, ¿verdad? Y entendemos que, que eso pasa en múltiples idiomas. Y entonces, más allá del acceso a esos idiomas, ¿verdad? El poder escuchar y, 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 y escuchar simplemente es la justicia del lenguaje, es, es el poder estar en estos tipos de intercambios. ¿verdad? donde hay un círculo sagrado que está pas pasando ¿verdad? en esos instantes donde podemos compartir nuestros saberes, nuestras estrategias, ¿verdad? pero también nuestras, nuestros modos de sanación, nuestras formas de poder, poder seguir haciendo lo que estamos haciendo. ¿verdad? Y lo que está pasando, está pasando a un nivel global, y más allá, ¿verdad? Entonces, para poder, para poder rectificar, para poder acordar, para poder conectarnos, necesitamos comunicarnos a través de diferentes idiomas. Y eso pasa más allá, como, como le digo, de esta definición expansiva del lenguaje. No solamente son palabras, ¿verdad? No solamente son palabras, no solamente es idioma, ¿verdad? Pero eso, el poder interpretar el corazón, ¿verdad? Lo que alguien está sintiendo en un momento, esa canalización, esa canalización, ¿verdad? Por eso es importante, porque así nos podemos ver, y no solamente con los ojos, ¿verdad? Y no solamente escuchar con los oídos, pero sino con nuestros corazones, con nuestros seres enteros, ¿verdad? Y recibirnos, y ahí poder querernos más y querer a la tierra más, que es una y la misma. Sometimes when I hear people say that language is a barrier, and I always say it's actually the complete opposite. It's the complete opposite to me. I think when people speak different languages, it means that they have different ways of understanding the world. En español, los pueblos dicen cosmovisión. Incluso el, el solo esa palabra, cosmovisión, cosmovision in English, Normally, the, the translation would be maybe worldview, but the word in Spanish talks about cosmovision. And when I think about why it was important to have language justice in this intercambio, it's precisely that. Like we had folks from a Garifuna cosmovision, Lenca cosmovision, immigrants in the US cosmovision, uh, black folks in the US cosmovision, trans women cosmovision and more and more and more all coming together just like think about less of a barrier but actually the the openness of the possibilities 
of thinking, of understanding what's happening and thinking of creating better worlds, our turn alternatives worlds to what we have now. And not just in, uh, in dream form, but these are folks that are already in practice doing that and being in exchange with each other um, about that. So language justice was important to make a level of those connections happen. Because again, yeah, it's not only just words being interpreted through the, through the machine with people interpreting, but, um, but yeah, uh, I mean, what else, what else? Like language justice is one of the pillars for build, building movement and solidarity movements um, across the world. And especially with people who are in luchas the things, the power, the power of that learning and those intercambios. I've been uh, really present with the fact that the work that, that we've been doing with MEV and this cohort has deeply, deeply, deeply changed the way that I do language justice, the way that we do language justice. It has expanded it, it has deepened it, it has made it grow into something incredible. I think, you know, We've been in this conversation and dialogue and sometimes a little bit of a push and pull on both sides. And what MEB has brought to us has been like a literally lifting of some bales that our, our language justice movement had that has to do with like making sure that there's more black folks doing this work. This is one of the blackest teams that we've ever, ever had in, in, in a gathering or a conference. And our team reflects so much of the, ex of the experience and the identities of uh, movement makers, indigenous, queer, uh, two-spirit, black folks, um, and, and more, yeah? So, so there's that. And I think there's also like the, the depthness of the conversation of, of healing shame about our accents, of bringing uh, the Black English, bringing the Caribbean Spanishes as, as expansive as ways that are actually decolonizing these, these languages that we would normally call their dominant languages. But, but yeah, even like what, what we mean by dominant language is actually more like the standard white English, but there's so much more, you know, to see reflected in that. So I, from two years ago to now, I know that our practice has completely shifted because of this experience and because of how, like the generosity of MEV, of Monica, Ramelsi, really like just pushing us, pushing us to deepen and deepen and liberate, like liberate this practice, this practice of language justice that actually we had been doing in a way that was still very connected to white supremacy, you know? So it just, it's, it's not gonna be the same. It's not gonna be the same.